phone, and I called the Fraser Institute and got the head of one of these legends on the phone, Michael Walker. And Michael Walker spent an hour on the phone with me explaining how he set up the Fraser Institute, giving me advice on how to get started, and then he said that you have to talk to the people at the Atlas Economic Research Foundation. And they, we got in touch with them and they said, you want to start a free market think tank in Hong Kong, that's great. They gave us 5,000 US dollars to get on an airplane, go to the deep woods of Michigan, and take a two-day training course at the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. And then we got to go to their conference, which I believe was in Chicago, it was 10 years ago. But at that time, there were three people in that course in the backwoods of Michigan who are here tonight with me. And they are all dear friends. And one of them is right in front of me, that's Parth Shah. Another one. Another one is Barun, Barun Mitra, who's over there talking to Simon Lee. Barun. Barun, look up with me. There you go. Can you hear my voice? Look up here. Okay, and the other one was Nonoy Opus, who was running a free market think tank in the Philippines. So there are a lot of people who have been on similar journeys to us and I'm really grateful for them to be here tonight. But once again, it started with a phone call to the Fraser Institute and they have continued to be a good friend of the Lion Rock Institute over the years. Hong Kong has been in the number one spot of their economic freedom index since it began. They've come and presented here in partnership with the Lion Rock Institute before and they are doing so again. Our speaker this evening has been a great friend to us just as the Fraser Institute has been. He is originally from Eastern Canada, a place called Nova Scotia, but he, he managed to make his way to the civilized parts of Canada to lend his brain power to the Fraser Institute. Tonight, he is going to present to you this year's results of the Economic Index of the Economic Freedom of the World Index. So, without any further ado, please help welcome our friend from the Fraser Institute in Vancouver, Mr. Fred McMahon. Comments. And needless to say, I agree uh, uh, with all of them. This is an incredible event, and two groups in particular truly have to be complimented. Of course, the Lion Rock Institute, the great job that Andrew and his friends did in setting it up, the building and maintaining it, and the amazing job that Peter Wong and his uh, colleagues. Uh, 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 Lawrence and, and the other people that work with the do just incredible. And of course, the Frederick Nauman uh, Foundation, which works for a freedom network all across Asia and does amazing good uh, around the world. Uh, Ziggy, who was introduced to you earlier, and uh, Peck, where are you, Peck? Ah, there, no. Okay, well, oh, over there, and Pet does an amazing job in organizing this conference. So we really have to congratulate these people that make this event uh, possible. I'm here to talk about the Economic Freedom Index uh, for this year. I'll make a very few brief remarks about what economic freedom is. It is basically the ability of individuals and families to make their own economic decisions. As simple as that, it's a freedom, and a core freedom. We look at five separate areas, size of government, the government takes too much of your property away and spends too much of it, reduces the space for free exchange, economic freedom is, is reduced. Rule of law, this is something I'm going to come back to later. This is the essential infrastructure of economic freedom, without an impartial rule of law, detached from government, that can make decisions that government does not like, and obeys the rule of law, not the government. That is the essential infrastructure. If you do not have that, the rich and powerful, the government, the cronies, those with inside influence, can reduce your property, reduce your space for economic freedom, and destroy the dynamism of, the, of an economy like Hong Kong. This is the essential part of economic freedom. Sound money? Government can um, 
take away your property just as easily through inflation as it can through taxation. Trade, one of the great generators, the miracle that is Hong Kong. You should be able to buy and sell from anybody in Hong Kong and buy and sell from anybody in the world. By the way, I've got to, I just want to mention, for those of you living here in Hong Kong, I have an envy problem. This is the best place in the world to live. The most exciting and dynamic city on the planet. Uh, if anyone has a job to offer me in Hong Kong, I'll give you my telephone number. This is just an amazing uh, place. And finally, regulation. Regulation of business. You should be able to start a business and close a business when you wish. It's astonishing. In many parts of the world, you literally can't start a business without a year's process. And then if you want to close your business, you can't. They'll drain every cent out of your account uh, before you're allowed to close your business. Labor. You should be able to work for whom you wish or hire whom you wish. Credit. You should be able to borrow for whom you wish or lend to whom you wish. Talk about making a difference. And this goes back to what Andrew was saying about Michael Walker. He started all this. We now have partner think tanks in 90 nations and territories. And these, and it's interesting, these are places that often don't get along with each other. We have a partner institute in Russia and a partner institute in Georgia. We have a partner institute in Israel and a partner institute in the Gaza Strip. We have a partner institute in Colombia and a partner institute in Venezuela. What these people are devoted to, just like the Lion Rock Institute, just like the Frederick Nauman Foundation, is producing freedom and prosperity for their people. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll give you a second to read that. Okay, good. Now, this is this year's Economic Freedom Index. And as Andrew said, it, Hong Kong is still number one. We have data back to 1970. Every single year, Hong Kong is number one. This is a key reason for the miracle that is Hong Kong. I'm going to show you Hong Kong compared to Asia. Big gap, but what you see is the gap is closing. It's not closing because of a deterioration in Hong Kong. It's closing because Asia is getting more economically free. Slowly, but surely. And the Frederick Nauman Foundation's Asia work plays a big role in that. Now I'm going to show you something a little bit disappointing about Asia. Asia is only growing in economic freedom at the average pace of the world. They're almost identical. I think Asia can do better than that, and I'm sure that everybody here agrees with me. Why is economic freedom important? Well, the drive and ingenuity of individuals beats government planning or greedy crony capitalist elites hands down every day of the week. But one thing that we perhaps do not emphasize enough is the change in the dynamics of a society that economic freedom creates. Economic freedom liberates you from dependence on an all-powerful government or crony elites. It enables you to exercise your other freedoms, to express your opinion without worry that a crony capitalist is going to deprive you of your ability to make a, to have a job or feed and clothe your family or that an all-powerful government. It changes the dynamics in a way that's even more fundamental than that and that is important to so many Asian nations. Without economic freedom, growth, as we will explore in a moment, is slow. When you win power, you win everything. The whole shebang. It's not about making policy. You get to pass out the wealth and the riches 
of the society. That makes it so important for an ethnic group or a sectarian group or a tribe to gain power because then they can award their friends and their cronies. And this sets group against group because it's a, 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 an almost winner take all situation. You're the in group and the other tribe, the other sectarian group, is the out group. They get no rewards, you get to pass off stuff to your friends. You gain by setting people against people. You gain by making people worse off. In an economically free society, a truly economically free society, not these crony capital states that sometimes parade as being economically free society, in a truly economically free society, you can only gain by making other people better off, by making goods and services other people voluntarily want to buy. You see the change in dynamics? From gaining by making people worse off to gaining by making people better off. Not only that, it cuts across all the sectarian, tribal, religious divides that I mentioned earlier. Instead of that person being your enemy and wanting to deprive you of privilege if they get in power, that person from the other tribe or sectarian group or ethnic group becomes your employee, your customer, your supplier, even uh, members of the business association that you're in. So instead of setting people against people, it cuts across these divides. It's not an overnight miracle, but when you look around the world, it's the economically free societies that are the most tolerant. Now, Hong Kong is one of the most tolerant places in the, on the planet. Not surprisingly, it's the most economically free place on the planet. But in many Asian countries, this would be a huge change in societal dynamics. So I'm just going to show you some snapshots in time. Uh, these are correlations, not causation. But everything I'm going to show you is actually backed up by much more sophisticated uh, economic uh, statistical research. So the quarter most free economic nations have a per capita GDP of about $40,000 a year. The least free, about $6,000 a year. This is the dynamism that I talked about earlier. Now, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, yeah. Economic freedom is fine. <laughs> the rich take it all and the poor just get poor. This shows you the per capita income of the poorest 10%. It's $11,000 in the freest nations. It is, about, it is under $1,000 in the least free nations. This reflects what I was talking about about other freedoms. Civil rights and democratic rights are much stronger in economically free nations for the reasons of the dynamics I talked about earlier. Lack of economic freedom is the raw material of corruption. If you need to ask somebody's permission, government official, a member of the crony elite, if you need to ask somebody's permission to do something, well, there's someone to pay off. You don't need to ask anybody permission. You're free to do it. There's no one to pay off. You know, maybe you'll take $20 out of one pocket and put it in the other, but there's no one to pay off. Corruption dwindles. This is life satisfaction or um, happiness, depending on the way the research report uh, continues. It. You know, and this makes you feel sorry for our friends on the left who want a socialist economy. They gave up a little while ago saying uh, socialism was the more efficient economic system. They recognized that uh, economically free societies produce wealth, but they said, oh, that doesn't matter. We want a happy society. And of course, socialism is going to make people happy, and free markets are going to make people sad. It doesn't work out that way. Even when you correct for income, 
economically free societies have a higher level of life satisfaction than non-economically free societies. And that is doubtless because when you're in charge of your fate, when you control your fate, it gives you a greater sense of satisfaction and lack of control when you are non-economically free. In an economically free society, each individual means something as an individual, not as a member of a group. That puts a priority on education, on education of boys and girls, men and women. Education goes, achievement goes up in economically free society, and the gap between men and women, boys and girls, decreases. And that is a huge challenge around the world which economic freedom can help me. Now, it would not be appropriate to be here tonight without making a reference to what's happening on the streets of Hong Kong. I want to say, I want to give a little bit of intellectual machinery first. Democracy is not freedom. Hong Kong has had an immensely high level of democracy for decades. Uh, sorry, an immensely high level. Uh, <laughs> freedom for decades without having democracy. As the famous philosopher of freedom, Isaiah Berlin, noted, the question of who rules me is logically distinct from the question of whether somebody restrains my actions. Now, that said, democracy, while separate conceptually and practically from freedom, is, is the system best equipped to protect freedom over the long run, not the short run, the long run. And I think there are many things that motivate the democracy demonstrators in Hong Kong. And I'm not going to go into all of them, but I think one of their key concerns is protecting the institutions of Hong Kong that create freedom. Particularly that cornerstone institution, the rule of law, separate from government control, and with everyone equal before it. As I say, I don't think that's the only thing that motivates them. Many things do, but I think that's part of their concern. Now, this is the rule of law in Hong Kong compared to other areas of economic freedom. Hong Kong, with all its achievements, its weakest area now is the rule of law. In every single year, the rule of law is below every other single variable uh, in Hong Kong's rating. So that's all the way back to 1970. So you may think that's of some concern, but Hong Kong soars above the world average in the rule of law. And it soars even higher above the Chinese mainland average in the rule of law. And that leads to concerns. China is typically below the world average in the rule of law, as you can see from this chart. Now, it did catch up, but it's been declining in recent years. So, Hong Kong is 23rd in the world in rule of law. I think it could and should do better than that. But its rank, its score has declined somewhat, but its rank has been steady in the 20s. Uh, it's 23rd now in the 20s uh, for, since the year 2000. China is 71st in the world in rule of law 
and it's in decline. One of the things that I believe motivates the demonstrators is deep concern about institutions like the rule of law with creeping mainland influence. And I'm not going to go through them, but there have been several instances of the mainland putting stresses on Hong Kong to be patriotic. In fact, one of the white papers out of Beijing calls for judges to be patriotic. If a judge is patriotic, a judge is not a judge. They're putting patriotism and the rule of the government ahead of the rule of law. Their master should be the rule of law and their decisions should not have anything to do with patriotism, not have anything to do with what the government wishes, but have only to do with what the rule of law says. Fairness, independence from government. Now, the way the basic law works is if the mainland gets control over the selection of the chief executive, you know, by basically determining which candidates can run. Over the longer term, they get control over the judiciary. Now, I'm not saying that this is something that would happen overnight. I don't think the rule of law is going to fall apart in Hong Kong, regardless of what Beijing does in the next year, the next two years, the next three years. But you can have a creeping undermining of the rule of law in Hong Kong through mainland influence. And I think that's one of the things that concerns the demonstrators. I can't make a prediction on it. Um, I don't know China's motivation, but I think there is real concern about the two systems, one country aspect, considering some of the moves recently uh, of Beijing. I appreciate your patience in listening to an outsider uh, talk about this. None of this changes my opinion that Hong Kong is the best place on the planet to live, to set up a business, to grow wealthy, to exercise your freedom. And it would be such a tragedy, not just for Hong Kong, but for the whole world, if that was undermined in any way. So again, I appreciate your patience, particularly with what might be somewhat controversial remarks, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, ever since I was a teenager and I've known the work of the Fraser Institute, one of their hallmarks has been uh, to be frank and straightforward. And Fred, we thank you very much for your remarks.